Um, and Meredith is a clinical psychologist and an associate professor here at Queen's. She also runs the SAGE lab, which is the sexuality and gender lab. I'm sure you'll talk a bit more about that. Yes. But anyway, I'd like to hand it over to you, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for coming today. So, first of all, happy International um, Women's Week. Um, such a gorgeous day to kick that off. Um, and happy to see some friendly faces, folks I know who came out, so thanks for coming today. Um, so, this is going to be a really informal discussion. Um, I, I want to start off telling you a little bit about who I am and how I ended up doing the kind of work that I do here at Queen's. And then talk about um, uh, the research that we're doing and I think that the implications that it has for moving towards what we, I talked about in my little blurb, sort of a new understanding of women's sexuality and, and sexual wellness. Um, so, as Lisa mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I got my PhD from Northwestern University, oh my goodness, 12 years ago. Um, and, uh, and prior to that, did a, a degree in neuroscience and became really interested in, in sexuality, uh, sexuality research um, and pursued that throughout graduate school. And when I got through graduate school and, and I got my PhD and I went through the process of becoming licensed as a clinical psychologist, I was pretty sure that I was going to go into a more applied type of setting. I felt really passionately about, um, about working with, um, with women to enhance their, their sexuality and sexual wellness and thought I wanted to do that in a hospital setting, in a clinical type of setting. And so I ended up in Toronto at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health and I worked there for a couple of years, um, but had great difficulty in, uh, convincing the powers that be at the hospital that opening up a clinic that was dedicated to um, sexual wellness and, um, and particularly addressing a major gap in Toronto's uh, services for people who had issues with their sexuality just didn't seem to be on their radar. And at the same time, I was pursuing a line of research that I'm going to talk about today that was really starting to produce a lot of counterintuitive and really challenging findings with respect to how people um, understood women's sexuality. And so I was at a sort of a, a moment in my life where I, I could see two paths going in different directions. And it was my mentor who sat me down and said, Meredith, you light up when you're in your laboratory. You really need to find a home to go and pursue the work that, that you started as a graduate student. And so he was right. I'm a total lab geek nerd type. Um, I love, and uh, there's a few of my students here, I love tinkering with equipment. Um, I love um, being in that, that type of environment and working with, uh, with data as well as with people. So I ended up here at Queen's six years ago. Um, and it's been a very warm reception. Um, I have to say, the work that I do is um, still viewed by so many people as being very taboo. Um, my laboratory, the Sexuality and Gender Laboratory, we focus um, quite a bit on studying sexual response, particularly in women. And so we are interested in understanding um, how it is that women experience their sexual arousal and their sexual desire and how that is expressed in their lives. And so we run a laboratory we have, where we have people come into our lab, we hook them up to equipment, they hook themselves up to equipment. I brought some, we're going to do a little show and tell in a few minutes. Um, but, uh, and, and we ask them to become sexually aroused in our laboratory and we measure all of these responses and then use this information to inform understanding of uh, women's sexuality. And so, you know, even in 2015, this is still, um, to a certain degree, a taboo subject, but we We've come a long way since researchers started doing this kind of work, which, uh, which started with Masters and Johnson. How many people here have watched or are watching the series Masters of Sex? So, a few hands. All right, so if any, how many people here watch Mad Men or have watched a couple episodes of Mad Men? Okay, so Masters of Sex is a little bit like Mad Men in the sense that it's got that period piece quality to it that's really interesting. Um, and kind of spectacular visually, but the narrative is such a fascinating one because it's telling the story of these two sexuality researchers and how they're able to carve out their passion for understanding this incredibly taboo subject, um, while of course all kinds of drama going on. So, 
Um, and this narrative, this undercurrent of, of um, emerging feminism as well, how, it is, how a woman could be in a scientific context and assert her intellect at the same time as being in an environment that really may not support, um, support her doing that. Um, so, highly recommend Masters of Sex. But, so, as we you know, look at where we are now in studying, um, studying women's sexuality, they, these folks, um, so uh, uh, Masters was an uh, obstetrician gynecologist and Virginia Johnson was his assistant. They were among the first to bring people into the laboratory and measure what happened physically when people were sexual. And they did it when people were sexual on their own, so when they were um, pleasuring themselves or masturbating, or when couples were coming into the laboratory. And so fast forward to where we're at, I don't think we could actually get away with doing stuff like that here on Queen's campus. And I get people asking me all the time, like, do you plan to do that? Do you plan to have couples come into a laboratory? And I, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to get to that point, but we are, um, we are definitely refining techniques in trying to understand the physiological components of women experiencing sexual response and at the same time trying to understand how that aligns with how women feel, how this aligns with their identity, their sexual attractions, and how this contribu uh, contributes to their, um, to their wellness. <coughs> so when I came on the scene and doing this research in the, in the late 90s, um, and in the sort of early 2000s, it was a really interesting time in sexuality research because um, we were in a place where there was a, sort of the, a broad um, application of an equality type of model. That women's and men's sexuality was, um, was equivalent in a lot of ways. You know, we could study both women and men. And, and the idea was that the models or the way that we understood how women and men functioned were very, very similar. And so when I started doing research in this area, I started getting results, which I'll, I'll talk about, which didn't fit with that. And so that really for me, pushed me to think very carefully about how gender, so how we, uh, um, how we construct and identify ourselves predominantly as women, thank you for the one man who has come to <laughs> this talk, but as women, how, um, how we identify and, and communicate and experience our gender and how that has an influence on our sexuality and the expression of our sexuality. And I really never thought that I was going to go there in my research program, but everything that was happening around me made it so that I had to go there um, to begin to understand the kinds of things that we were finding. And so where I found myself is, in, is now in, in a career looking at how I can use the, the expertise that I have and guide my students along a path of integrating both a psychological perspective, so understanding um, you know, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, as well as the physiological components of women's sexuality, and how that is really unique from men's sexuality, and how that uniqueness can, um, can inform how it is that we try to cultivate sexual wellness in women, and from a clinical perspective, so me being a, a, in a previous life a sex therapist, how we can use that information to better help women who are having um, uh, problems and issues with their sexuality. Um, so, I, I should mention, if at any point any of you have any questions or comments that you want to make, please feel free to jump in. And if I, as uh, Lisa mentioned, I will happily stick around afterwards. Um, and if you have questions that you don't want to direct directly to me, feel free to email me and um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that, that you have, especially if there's topics that you really wanted to learn about and I'm not touching on to, um, today, but feel free to jump in with those. So um, in, uh, in the sexuality and gender laboratory, so we're, we're in Humphrey Hall, and um, in our lab, uh, we ask women and, and men, but predominantly women, to come into the laboratory and to participate in experiments where we're going to measure their physical responses to sexual stimuli. So we have women either listen to erotic stories or we show them erotic films. Um, and in other laboratories, people will use other things like asking women to engage in a, a pleasurable sexual fantasy. Um, or uh, other laboratories will actually use tactile stimulation, so like a, a genital vibrator. And then we will measure physiologically what's happening with a woman's body. 
So when people get sexually aroused, women in particular, there's um, a, a whole host of changes that happen in the body, but the one that's very specific to women experiencing sexual response is um, increased blood flow to our genitals, so to our labia, to our clitoris, to our vagina, and there's changes to um, those structures that we can measure. And so this is the show and tell portion of, um, of my talk. So there's a whole bunch of ways that we can measure what's happening with women's bodies as they get sexually aroused, and I'm going to show you a couple of them. So this device right here, this is called a vaginal photoplethysmograph, and um, <laughs> All of my students, yes. <laughs> Such a big word. <laughs> All my students have to practice it over and over Is it and over in Scrabble? again. Scrabble. <laughs> I haven't been able to spell it in Scrabble yet. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this um, this tampon shaped portion of the device. This is um, it's it's about the size of a menstrual tampon, and it's made of acrylic plastic. And inside of this, there's a, a light source, and um, there's also a photoresistor. Basically, how this uh, device works, that how many of you go to the gym and have ever used like a, an ear clip to measure your heart rate? Have you ever seen one of those? Or you hold the handlebars that will measure your heart rate. So a lot of those devices use a similar kind of principle to measure what's happening with blood flow in order to capture your heart rate. This device, what it does, woman inserts it into her vagina, and this um, light source illuminates the wall of the vagina and the light that gets bounced off of the wall of the vagina comes back, gets picked up by this um, photoresistor and then gets um, uh, transformed into what looks like a heartbeat type of waveform. And um, as a woman gets aroused, so we see this, this it, oh, it's like we're measuring women's heart rate through the vagina. It's a bit of, you know, a backwards route, but um, we, can, we can literally do that. But what we're not interested in how fast that beat happens, we're interested in how big that beat becomes, so what we call the amplitude of that signal. Um, and so women can insert this into the vagina completely in private. It's one of the reasons we really like using this instrument, because we can instruct women on how to use it. They can go into a room, a private room. They can lock the door. If there's dimmed lighting, we try to make it as homey and comfortable as possible while fully recognizing that it's a completely weird laboratory environment. Um, so women would insert this into their vagina, and this is just a placement device, and it sits up against the vulva, against the labia, to just control the depth and the, the orientation of the probe. And so this device has been around now for, um, oh my goodness, 45 years? Since wow. the, yep, since the late 60s. So right on the heels of Masters and Johnson publishing their research, a guy named James Gear was really interested in developing a device that we could use to specifically measure what was happening in women's bodies as they were experiencing sexual arousal. Um, and so he came up with the original prototype for this, and this is the 2015 incarnation of it. We have a, a lab in Amsterdam that makes these, um, makes these for us. So I'm going to pass this around. You can take a look at that. So that's one way that we... Um, we measure sexual response in women in the laboratory. Now this device um, is both a vaginal photoplethysmograph, so very similar to this one. It's a little thinner, the, the um, probe itself is a little bit longer. Um, this device right here is a clitoral photoplethysmograph. And so this device, um, so I have, to, I have to make my hand vulva. This is where I need, I need to buy myself a vulva puppet. Believe me, they exist. I have friends who are sex educators who have vulva puppets that they walk around with, but I haven't done this yet. Um, but if I, um, I need an assistant. Do you want to help me out? <laughs> you have to insert for me. So if I, if I make this into a vulva where this is my, my clitoris and this is sort of the vaginal area, you would insert that part into the vagina and then the, what we call the nose, it kind of looks like a nose in profile, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The nose sort of sits between the labia and it doesn't measure blood flow to the part of the clitoris I think that we all think of as being our clitoris. And I think most of us think of our clitoris as being sort of that little button-like, very sensitive area at the top of your vulva. The, the clitoris is actually a pretty amazing, massive internal structure. How many people here have seen a picture of the internal Wonderful, fantastic. So those of you who haven't, 
your homework after today <laughs> is to go home and Google <laughs> clitoris and go to the Wikipedia page. Um, and there's a really great uh, schematic diagram that shows you just how big the internal clitoris is. And we'll also, here I'll pass this on, um, we'll also link you to um, the, the Museum of Sex. Has anybody been to the Museum of Sex in, um, in New York? I highly recommend it. Um, but of course, I'm a sex researcher. <laughs> um, the Museum of Sex has a blog, actually, that has a, a link on it, too, that shows you more of what that internal structure looks like in relative to other pelvic organs, so how it, in relation to the urethra and to the vagina and to the uterus. Um, and also um, shows you what, what happens or what we believe happens when, when women become sexually aroused, how that tissue changes. So the tissue of the, of the clitoris is very similar to the tissue of, um, of the penis, so the parts of, the, of men's penises that engorge with blood during erection. Um, and so what we measure with the, the nose part of the device is not the, the um, external part of the clitoris, but an internal part of the clitoris called the bulb of the clitoris. And this is a very, very new device um, that we're um, in the process of trying to figure out what it is that we're measuring and how it works. Um, other researchers have done things like used um, magnetic resonance imaging, which MRIs are probably familiar with their application to doing brain scans or other parts of uh, doing body scans. Um, there's researchers at the University of Washington who have used an MRI to image women's pelvis to see what's happening with the, the clitoral structures. But as you can imagine, with a lot of sexuality research, we struggle to get funding, we struggle to get resources um, to, you know, impress upon funding agencies that these are really important questions that we need to um, that we need to be able to uh, answer so we can you know contribute to understanding more about women's sexual wellness so um, other ways we measure sexual response we've also been using um, a, a camera called a, a thermal imaging camera that measures the uh, changes in body temperature in the genitals and my graduate student Jackie has been, who's in the green sweater in the corner there, has been, uh, been using this thermal imaging camera to <laughs> measure sexual response in, in both women and men. So there's a number of different ways that, that we do this in the lab. So we're not only interested in measuring what's happening with people's bodies, but in, in some sense, more importantly, we want to understand people's experience of feeling sexually aroused um, and how that integrates with their, their physical experience. Um, and so we, um, so we also ask women as they're watching or listening to erotica to report to us how it is that they're feeling. And so we do that um, in a number of ways. How many people here have participated in a psychological research study before? So a good number of you. So you're familiar with the kinds of scales that psychologists will give, rate right on a, a number from you know, zero to nine, where zero is nothing, nine is the highest how you're feeling in this moment. So we will ask people to complete questions like that, and we'll also ask women, um, as they're watching or listening to erotica, to report how it is that they're feeling. And so what we're really interested in, one of the things that we're interested in, is how those two components fit together. Yeah? When you ask them how they're feeling, physically or emotionally? Or what we ask them both. So um, we will ask women to tell us things like how turned on do you feel? How sexually aroused do you feel? How much genital sensation or tingling do you feel? So we'll ask that question in a number of different ways because I think that for all of us what it means to be turned on can be really different. And so we ask it in a bunch of different ways so we can kind of converge on what that, um, what that answer is. So, um, so you, the sort of the basis of a lot of the work that we do is really about trying to understand this mind-body relationship um, in women, mm -hmm. and like I, I mentioned before, this was something that I never thought I was going to pursue with this much rigor. But I was doing research when I was a graduate student that was showing that the relationship between mind and body when women experience sexual response seems to be pretty different from what we were seeing with men. And whereas with men it seemed that very often their physical response and their mental response, um, so feeling turned on, feeling like having sex, were very closely related to one another, for women there seemed to be way more variation. Um, and 
I want to be careful here and not say that there's a disconnect or that there's no relationship. Although very often when I speak to the media about this research, that's what they say. Women don't know what they want. Women are disconnected from their bodies. Um, men are in perfect alignment. Women, you know, we're a mess. We don't know what, we, what, uh, what we're feeling or, or what we want. And I think that that's a really terrible mis uh, mischaracterization of what we're seeing. That a lot of the work that I do has to do with gender differences, and um, I think it's very tempting for people to focus on characterizing men as sort of one clump of individuals and say, all men are like this, and all women are like this. And the reality is that there's actually a lot of overlap in the ways that women and men um, experience their sexual response, but on average there seems to be a difference. So if we take all the data from men and we pile that together, and we take all the data from women and we pile that together, yeah, it seems like that mind-body relationship for women, it's not as strong, but it's there. Um, and I can't tell you how often I get into fights with journalists over this. It's, I'm currently having a fight with somebody at the UK Guardian trying to get a retraction published and it's such a pain. I just wish she would have phoned me first and then hopefully we <laughs> would have avoided this. <laughs> but I, I feel really passionately about that because I feel that, that you know, other than coming to um, talks like this, or um, I, you know, being in other kinds of sort of knowledge translation venues where I get to talk to um, talk to women, the media can very often be the mouthpiece for researchers that communicate our scientific findings. And so I feel it's so important for, for me as a researcher to do everything I can to get that right. So, again, for women, that relationship between mind and body seems to be less, uh, less strong on average than what we see with men. But what I think is way more fascinating is that there's so much variation. And so we see women who come into our laboratory whose minds and bodies are like, like this, in complete sync. They, they experience physical sexual responses and they're reporting, yes, I feel turned on, yes, I feel genital sensations. Then we have women who are the complete opposite. They're experiencing a, a physical response and they're actually reporting that they're not feeling turned on at all. And then we see other women who are sort of in between there, where it seems like mind and body components of their sexuality seem to be a little bit um, somewhat in sync, but not in sync. And it's that variation that we're really interested in trying to understand. You know, models of sexual response. So if we think of sexual response as what happens when we're, we're feeling sexual or we're being sexual with another person. Usually we start to feel turned on, we feel changes in our bodies, we start either interacting sexually by ourselves, so if we're going to self-pleasure, or we're going to interact with another person, and that arousal and that feeling, um, and you know, sexual feelings in your body and your feelings of excitement and being in the moment um, grow. You may experience a sexual climax, that might be an orgasm, for some people they don't experience orgasm, and then there's sort of a, di a dissipation or a resolution of that feeling of arousal. Um, and, you know, models of sexual response have supposed that in order for there to be really good sexual functioning, your mind and body need to be in sync with each other all the time. And this is kind of an assumption that people have made, not only in sex research, but if you look into other areas of psychological research, looking at um, emotional states. So when we feel emotions like anxiety, for example, now, everybody's had the experience of, of the panic moment of, oh, did I forget my, you know, did I lock my car keys in the car? Ah, and you feel your heart rate go up. You, maybe you feel a little bit of a rush of adrenaline if it's something scary that's happened. There's a physical component to that emotional state that maps onto what it is that you're thinking. But what's really fascinating is that even among emotion researchers, they're beginning to find out that that mind-body connection in emotional states also has a lot more flexibility and fluidity to it than people originally supposed. And so we're finding the same thing with research on, um, on sexual response. So um, in our lab, we have sort of three basic lines of research that we're conducting right now. So the first one is very much in trying to understand 
biophysical or physiological factors and how those have an impact on sexual responding. And so this is where we would do things like measure sexual response using a number of different methodologies. So we want to measure what's happening in women's clitorises with this clitoral gauge. We want to measure what's happening in the external part of women's genitals with their vulvas using a thermal imager. Um, we want to be able to compare what happens during women's sexual response to what happens to, uh, during men's sexual response. We've also done research looking at how women's menstrual cycle hormones, how those relate to patterns of sexual responding in the laboratory. So we're, uh, that's an ongoing line of research that, that continues. Um, the second line of research starts to look at how social factors have an uh, impact on sexual responding. So we're interested in things like how it is that gender norms, so the, sort of the scripts that we have as women, how those um, inform what it is we're supposed to do sexually, how we're supposed to feel about our sexuality. So it probably comes as no surprise to hear that one of the gender norms is that we are supposed to be, as women, a stereotype, sexually demure, demure creatures. We're not supposed to express a need for sex, we're not supposed to want sex, and there's all kinds of negative stereotypes that come along with women being empowered and expressing their sexuality. So I'm sure some of you have heard the term slut-shaming, or the double standard. You know, these are all terms that reference, for women, there's, there's punishment that's associated with expressing and enjoying your sexuality, whereas for men, on average, there's, there aren't those same kinds of um, factors that are trying to dampen or lessen expression of sexuality. If anything, there's sort of an, um, uh, an aggrandizing. So men are supposed to be more sexual. They're supposed to want more sexual partners. And it probably comes as no surprise for a lot of guys as well. That is a really limiting stereotype that has issues, you know, causes issues with their sexuality. We're also interested in other aspects of people's personalities and how those relate to sexual responding. So I've, I've done quite a lot of research looking at the relationship between sexual orientation and sexual identity and patterns of sexual responding in the laboratory. Um, and again, have been met with this really interesting disconnect that we see between what women respond to physiologically and what they say is sexually attractive to them or who they're sexually attracted to. And I'll talk more about that um, in a second. And then the, the last line of research that um, is a new one for the, the lab, and we've just um, begun a study this past November, uh, is to, to look at how sexual components of sexual response interact with one another. So, Thinking back to Masters and Johnson and sort of their pioneering contributions to sexuality, um, sexuality research as well as a clinical understanding of sexual functioning, they proposed a model of sexual response where people first feel a uh, feel sexual desire, like hunger or an urge or a craving for sex. And that this sort of craving or urge might arise fairly spontaneously. Once we've experienced that, that's going to motivate us to either seek out a sexual partner or uh, maybe we're going to seek out some erotica, maybe we're going to self-pleasure, or maybe we're not going to do anything, we're going to stifle it at that point. But say you do interact with a partner, you're going to experience sexual arousal, interact with that partner to the point of experiencing a sexual climax, and then there's a resolution in that um, arousal response. So that would be the whole sexual response cycle, as it's called. So one of the things that's happening right now in our uh, sort of this newer conceptualization is really starting to rethink where we put sexual desire and motivation in that whole cycle. And, and this sort of reimagining of what sexual desire is really emerged from a lot of the pioneering research that women um, had done in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. And really starting to see that for women, this idea of desire and arousal don't really seem to pull apart that much. For some women, they experience distinct desire and distinct arousal. But for a lot of women, those two ideas, those two experiences seem to be very strongly connected with one another. So that was one factor. The second factor was, um, was coming from a, a psychological perspective. Um, the idea that people would experience spontaneous anything was just really strange. 
because as psychologists, we think of our behavior and our physical responses as being reactions to things that are happening in our environment. And so instead of thinking of sexual desire as something that sort of magically pops into people's minds and suddenly you're filled with an urge for sex, that there has to be some kind of an antecedent. There has to be a stimulus of some kind. And so this um, sort of reimagining of how the sexual response cycle works takes sexual desire away from the beginning of the cycle as this thing that pops into your head and suddenly you want to be sexual and you're going to go find your partner and have sex to maybe it's something about responding to cues in your environment. Maybe you saw something sexy on a picture or you heard something or maybe it was something about the way that your partner looked at you in the morning and then you went away for the day and it kind of sat in the back of your brain and you mulled it over. That there's something that begins to kindle that experience. And that instead of, um, instead of uh, um, desire happening first and then motivating the experience of sexual arousal that may be experiencing some degree of an arousal response to these cues in your environment then leads people to be motivated to seek out sex. So this is what we've been really interested in trying to understand. So the next to the docket in the sexuality and gender laboratory is trying to understand how do arousal and desire fit with each other. Because we found that you know, women's minds and their bodies can have this separation. We found that women's desires or their sexual attractions can be really different from what we see in physical response patterns. So we want to try to understand this other component um, and look at um, you know, what happens to women's desire when they experience sexual arousal. All of the models would say that desire doesn't, come, doesn't bring uh, a woman to a state of arousal. It's actually desire that emerges from an experience of sexual arousal. And so this conceptualization of desire has been one that is sort of a responsive thing, that we respond to the people and the cues in our environment, as opposed to kind of waiting for there to be this pop into your head of, I want sex now, and now I'm going to go seek it out. And that's a really different perspective, I think, than how we typically think of how male sexuality works. I think we think of male sexuality, or the, the common thinking is that men have a sex drive, they take that sex drive, and they drive it to what it is that they're interested in, and they express that sex drive. And where this starts to get problematic is beginning to conceptualize women's sexual wellness, and how it is that we frame issues with arousal and desire. You know, do we, um, are we using a model that was mostly based on data from men and trying to apply that to women? Um, or are we using data and research from women to begin to inform how it is that we can um, better help women experience sexual wellness? All right, I need a drink. Does anybody have any questions while I'm taking a sip of something? I'm wondering about... Um women and the, whether you get sort of socially appropriate responses if someone goes into the lab yes. and whether they think the response would be, yes, I want to claim I did have some sexual arousal or no, I, I don't want to claim that I did. Like, do you factor that in somehow or how do you measure that? Absolutely, we measure that. So um, we published a study in the past year which looked at a... Um, aspect of people's personality called socially desirable mm -hmm. responding. Mm -hmm. So people who want to present themselves in a very positive mm -hmm. light. And these kinds of questionnaires ask people questions like, I always play, pay my parking tickets, I never have bad thoughts about people, um, you know, I always read the newspaper every morning when it comes to my door. And we can capture a, a phenomenon called impression management. So how it is that people modify their expression of themselves to others in such a way to fit with a norm. And what we found um, was that women who were higher in impression management tended to report less um, sexual arousal in the laboratory. So this is absolutely one of those social factors that we're interested in. So now we have that information, we can use that in our future studies to um, statistically control <coughs> for variability in impression management um, so that we're getting a better, a better assessment of where women are at. 
But you know, as a side note, when we did this study, so this was this was one that my my student Jackie and, and my postdoctoral fellow Kelly um, that we worked on together. I was really surprised when these results came out because the women who come into our laboratory are not you know a random pick of the population. I mean, you can all imagine that it's not everybody who says, "Yeah, I want to go into a lab. I want to take off my pants. I want to sit in a chair. <laughs> I want to put a thing inside my vagina and then tell everybody how to turn on my feel." So we're fully aware of how biased our sample is, and we're actually in the process right now of conducting a study where we're, um, we're assessing those biases. And so it was really remarkable to me that, you know, even though we were taking this somewhat rarefied and, you know, sex positive end of the spectrum, so women who participate in these studies tend to be more sexually open, have more sec um, positive sexual attitudes, they tend to have more sex partners, they masturbate more often, and so on. So even as we just sample those women, even among that group, there's still this ability for something like impression management to be acting. And so, again, a really important thing for us to know more about as we try to make these inferences about um, women's sexual responding. Yeah. Interesting. Yes? I have a question about the relationship between the body and sexuality, or you know, the body and mind mm -hmm. relation. Yeah. Um, and this is a really big topic, but I was wondering if you could comment on any research done on uh, women who have more complex relationships with their body due to perhaps a disability or pain. Great question. So um, I don't know of any research that looks at um, specifically women who have physical disability. Is, is that what you were thinking of? Um, but there's uh, another researcher in the psychology department, Carolyn uh, Pucal. She runs the Sexual Health Research Laboratory. We're separate entities, but we're really lucky here. We have two sex researchers in the, in the same department. She's been looking at um, sexual response in women who experience genital pain, so vulvodynia. Um, and um, I think, I don't think she has yet, although I'm going to look to my lab members. Has she published any research recently looking at LDI? She uses a, an instrument called the laser Doppler imager to measure genital responding, self-reported response. I can't think of... There's the Boye paper. The Boye paper. But it was more self-report, and it was a very yeah, yeah. But out of like 20 results that yes. might be true. Yeah, okay. So there's not a lot at this point. Um, and did you have a sort of a, a specific idea about how those might relate? Oh, well, I'm just coming from an occupational okay. standpoint. Yeah. So like as, and we're interested in helping people engage in activity. Okay. And those activities might include of the sexual nature. So like Absolutely. So a have experiencing um, physical disability, sure. be it a wheelchair, yes. or, or maybe they're experiencing depression, yeah. then having this information, this research would really inform what we could do. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of about treatment, but this is a, a great segue to say that um, in sex therapy, so I've done sex therapy with folks who have um, either um, issues like dealing with depression or have physical issues that are, are getting in the way of them experiencing their sexuality um, as other typically functioning people would. And um, it's a very idiosyncratic approach, but a lot of the sex therapy techniques really focus on helping people um, recognize their, their sexual response um, to, and to learn to connect with those feelings. Um, and so it's not uncommon to, um, to help people find ways to, for example, learn how to self-pleasure um, and work, if they're in a relationship, to work with their partner as well to, um, around issues of communicating uh, uh, pleasure and as well what, what it is that they desire. So I'm going to, I'm just looking at the time, I wanted to talk um, a bit about about treatment and so what um, what I think this research can say about the ways that um, we do psychological treatment of issues for women who are having um, problems with arousal or desire um, and also how it informs um, the kinds of pharmaceutical treatments that um, are currently not available but there's a lot of 
various companies who were trying to make that available to women. So one of the things that I found pretty remarkable in doing, in doing this research and, and looking at this you know, potential for this mind-body independence when it came to um, sexual arousal and desire was research that looked at um, uh, drugs like Viagra. So everybody's familiar with Viagra. It's a, you know, a drug used by men to stimulate um, their ability to experience a penile erection when they're exposed to sexually stimulating material or a partner. And the, the, the drug itself works by making um, neurochemicals that are associated with, um, with vasoengorgement or blood pooling in the genitals available. It works exactly the same in women. And the researchers who had brought women into the laboratory and measured their responses when they took Viagra showed that, yes, they did show more vaginal blood flow. But this increased vaginal blood flow didn't translate into these women feeling any differently. And so um, and, you know, people always ask me, what happened to Viagra with women? And it's like, well, it just doesn't really work. That's um, essentially it. And so the pharmaceutical industry has moved to um, trying out drugs that have more of an effect on women's brains. Um, so how many people here have been um, aware of the Even the Score campaign with the Food and Drug Administration in the United States? Well, I know my students in my lab are because we, we talk about this all the time. So um, north of the border we don't pay as much attention to this kind of stuff, but there's been this really interesting argument going on that there's been gender bias in the Food and Drug Administration's approval of drugs for treatment of sexual dysfunction and that there's been bias in favor of men's sexuality and leaving women in the lurch, that we don't have any options. Um, and this has been sort of dubiously linked to the promotion of a particular drug called flubanserin, which is being um, a company called Sprite Pharmaceuticals is trying to get FDA approval for right now. And, um, and so there's this, you know, there's this call that gender bias is one of the reasons why we don't have drugs treating women's sexual dysfunction. And there's others in this argument who say, myself as a scientist, that we actually don't have, I think, a, a good enough understanding of what sexual desire is in women to be able to treat it with um, a drug like this. And the drugs that have been tried, they don't really have very powerful effects. And so you're asking women to take a drug in the case of this drug flubanserin, every single day that has a pretty significant side effect profile of making people feel sleepy and nauseous and other things, so that they can have a very marginal increase in their experience of sexual desire. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding that, that approach. And this, I, some of the controversy from the side of those people who are not pro-drugs also targets this idea of how it is that we're conceptualizing sexual desire. You know, if desire is supposed to be this spontaneous thing that pops into our heads and drives our behavior to be sexual, um, maybe a drug like this would work. But we've got all these data accumulating, all of these researchers saying, wait a second, we actually don't really see that so much in women. Um, then maybe that's not the way to go. And so the, the research that we're doing right now is aimed at informing what is this arousal desire relationship about? And is there maybe a non-pharmaceutical way that we can activate sexual de desire in women? And so one of my collaborators um, who's in Vancouver, at the Vancouver General Hospital, a woman named Dr. Lori Brado, has been um, promoting um, a psychological approach to um, working with women who have low desire. And instead of drug treatments, she's focusing on mindfulness techniques. How many folks here are familiar with the concept of mindfulness? Yeah, this is a fairly um, well-known phenomenon now, but this idea of being present in the moment, aware of, in this case, your, phys your physicality and your physical response, but doing it in a way that is non-judgmental. Um, and I think, you know, for women in particular, our relationships with our bodies are pretty complicated. We've received a lot of messages from a lot of different places about how our bodies are supposed to look, how they're supposed to function, and how our sexuality is supposed to be expressed. And so mindfulness is a way to, is sort of a, a wonderful approach of not only helping women reconnect with this physical sexual response, which seems pretty automatic and actually pretty potent in women. Women respond to a whole host of sexual kinds of images. 
um, more than what we see with, with men. I, I had one reporter recently say that she thought it was wonderful. It was like women had more stuff on the buffet than men did. <laughs> so we have this capacity to be very responsive, um, but we may not be connected to that. And so mindfulness is about sort of dialing into that aspect of our sexuality, not only being able to know when it is that we're experiencing these physical sexual responses, but to also be present in such a way that we're not being judgmental of them. I'm not supposed to feel that. I'm, you know, I'm dirty, I'm bad, I'm wrong because I'm having these kinds of sexual desires and feelings. So allowing those to emerge and then working with women to find a way to connect if they're in a partnered relationship and how they can um, share that with their partner. And it's a, a wonderful way of approaching that can, can be used with all kinds of different individuals dealing with all kinds of different barriers to experiencing and expressing their sexuality. So getting at your question about individuals with pain or physical disability. And so we're, um, we're uh, I'm hoping that in the next couple of years that we'll be able to bring some of that therapeutic technique. I'm going to be going on a sabbatical to um, Vancouver in the coming year and working with, with Dr. Brodo to um, learn how to do this type of therapy. And then I want to bring it back to Kingston. We have a sex therapy clinic um, affiliated with the psychology department that um, Carolyn Bucal heads up. And um, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to begin to offer these kinds of their group mindfulness sessions um, for women in the future. Because I know in Kingston that there's not a lot of um, sex therapy support um, and we can certainly make a difference in being able to offer that. So it's got eight minutes, eight minutes to one. Um, are there other questions that, um, that you folks have? Or feedback or comments? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the difference between mindfulness and self-awareness um, because I'm a little fuzzy on the idea, like when, when you first started talking about this like mind-body relationship, I wondered if it was a skill that needed to be developed, which mindfulness seems to be sort of a method to develop that skill, mm -hmm. to get that link between your body reaction, and it seems to be hindered by like social norms and feelings of guilt and shame that come when you become self-aware. Yes. So you start to like push away that self-awareness, mm -hmm. um, and instead, you know, block off the connection between your body and your mind. Absolutely. Um, but is mindfulness really the same as self-awareness? Like, does it involve acknowledging those feelings of like guilt and acknowledging the pressures of society? Um, in the way that she's teaching mindfulness, is she also teaching like, you know, where this is coming from? So understanding like all of the societal pressures, understanding. Absolutely. Yeah, then, and you, you said it really beautifully, which is it's not just being dialed into what's happening in your body, but it's recognizing and acknowledging all of the chatter that can happen in your mind at the same time, and all of those outside influences. And I think the key with mindfulness is being able to recognize that chatter and those, the, the you know, potentially shame, guilt, or all of those factors that are trying to increase that separation from your body, but not judging it at the same time or getting caught up in it. Because I, I was thinking there's actually maybe two things there at the same time, because there might be um, your self-awareness uh, in terms of what's going on in your body and the shame and stuff, but also being present, which is also part of mindfulness. So, sure. you know, sometimes you might be actually like kind of away thinking about other things in your life not paying attention to what's happening in the present moment, mm -hmm. which seem like uh, sort of two separate issues. And then when you talked about the people who are not necessarily in sync with their emotions and mm -hmm. that mind-body connection, mm -hmm. it, it sort of made me think of like the research on emotional intelligence and that link between the knowledge of your body and the knowledge of your emotions. Yes. So almost felt like it should be split between the mindfulness and the being present mm -hmm. and also the emotional intelligence and the understanding your emotions, understanding your thoughts, mm -hmm. um, being self-aware, being... Yes. Yes, absolutely. So this is sort of a, a newer application of mindfulness and um, it comes in the context of what we call psychoeducation, sort of just working with women to help them understand how their bodies work, how these types of social norms have an impact, um, and so that they would have a bit more knowledge when they're going into recognizing all those factors that are pulling them out of the moment, um, but trying also to cultivate that non-judgmental stance at the same time. Yeah, 
things. Yeah. And you haven't mentioned love or being in love. How does that connect with your research or does it? Or? So, yeah, that's a weird thing about our lab right now. We don't talk about love at all. <laughs> It's all sex all the time, um, but uh, there are definitely, you know, there's definitely other laboratories that are really interested in, you know, what, you know, what happens when people fall in love and the impact that that has on, um, on sexual response. And um, so I have colleagues who are really interested in um, a neurohormone called oxytocin. How many people here have heard about oxytocin, bonding hormone? So what happens with um, you know, post-coital cuddling and augmenting oxytocin? Oxytocin is released at the time of orgasm. Um, so from a sort of a biological perspective, how that influences sexual responding. And um, you know, hopefully at some point in our future, we might actually start talking about love and, and connectedness and relationships. It would be really interesting to see how those kinds of factors influence sexual response. I just think too that, like, uh, I'm an RN, and I just think too that uh, what you're doing with all this research, and this lady over here talked about her profession as an occupational therapist, like, I think there seems to be a lack of um, research uh, with, um, say, people that have had colostomies and yes. change in body image and all that sort Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. Like, there is a there's a real need for consultants, as you can say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for stuff like that. So maybe that you can get some funding for something like that. We've been, so um, in addition to the work that I do here at Queen's, I collaborate with a group of researchers based out of the University of Toronto, um, and we've been developing an online support group for women who are having sexual problems subsequent to gynecological cancer. So these are women who've had, um, you know, ovarian cancer, um, cervical cancer, and so on. And um, there's actually uh, been quite a lot of focus on how to help women, or you know, what the sexual functioning is of women in, who've had issues with gyne cancer. And there's been some research that's looked at the application with other populations, um, so people who've, like you said, had colostomies or who are sort of negotiating new configurations of bodies as they, as they age. And in doing the work with the, um, this woman, Catherine Klassen, out of U of T, you know, the piece of the puzzle that's missing is the knowledge translation, is being able to take the research and get it to the people who need it. And one of the things that I was really struck by in doing, um, doing this work is how many of the, the women who were part of these online support groups never actually had a discussion with their um, oncologist or their gynecologist about their sexual functioning. And so many of them were handed a pamphlet. Right. And it's like, so, you know, you've had your ovaries removed, you've been forced into medical menopause, everything's different, and we've taken away your uterus, here's a pamphlet. You know, have a nice day. That, that doesn't help women begin to you know, relearn how their body works after it has been through everything that it has been through. You know, I, ex I experienced that as a breast cancer patient. Yes. I mean, it was never discussed. I was young, like 45. And, yeah. Um, they did mention that chemotherapy might cause uh, menopause, or at least menopausal, like, condition. Mm -hmm. But it didn't even seem to be a consideration that, that as a woman, that that would affect me as strongly as it did. Yes. But I would say instantly. Yeah, yeah, and and I here again I think is you know there's such a need for us to have individuals who can meet with you as you're going through this process and counsel you and say this is this is what the impact is going to be, and um, and to also remoralize and say yeah these things are going to happen but we can help you find a way to still enjoy and express your sexuality. I think, I think that's something maybe uh, you can do to help bring it to people is educate. Medical, the medical yes. profession, and how how <coughs> important sexuality is to women too. Like we are not we, sexuality is important to us. Yes, and uh, that needs to be told. Absolutely, and after living through cancer as well, what are the, if sexuality can be such a wonderful part of reconnecting with your body that has made life very difficult for a while. Um, it's hopefully going to behave. But to, to feel physical and vital and to experience pleasure again. 
And there's so much benefit that can come from that, not only for folks who are dealing with cancer, folks who are dealing with pain or any other kinds of conditions. I think one of the things that, you know, when I first got on the path of studying sexuality that really fascinated me was that this is something that we all have within us. We all have this capacity to be sexual, whether or not we decide to share it with other people or not. Um, but we have within us the capacity to have, um, to have pleasure. And so much, so much has happened to separate us from that, being able to connect from that. And to be able to use that in our lives to, to uh, you know, how many women do I know who had disclosed to me, oh, I masturbate before I go to sleep because it makes me sleepy. I have a great sleep after I masturbate. Or, you know, sometimes when I'm having a lot of issues with pain, having an orgasm will really make the day go better. Um, but there's so much taboo that, can, that surrounds this idea that we can enjoy and express and use our sexuality in that way. Yeah, it's a huge missing link in the puzzle of how we get that information to um, the women and who need it. All there's, these people are young. They're in their 30s and 40s. They're in 50s as well. And you see that they don't have the support that they need. Mm -hmm. And they need that support for healing power, yeah. for a positive, uh, you know, Absolutely. And the connection with their partner, too. So, you know, the, that's another piece of it. So not just being able to experience pleasure yourself, but to be able to have a intimacy and support and, and love from your partner. And being sexual with your partner can be part of that. You know, it's not all just about orgasms and pleasure. It's about that intimacy and support, too. And having, being able to still have a sexual relationship um, allows you to, to nourish and tap into that. Woman in the white shirt, you had a question. Yeah, um, so my question was about uh, sort of how you select candidates for your studies and whether or not there are, at this point, restrictions on that. So, for example, you know, if women are on birth control, sure. which affects sex drive, or yeah. on antidepressants, that type of thing. So we have a number of different studies operating at any any time, and the, um, the criteria for women to enroll in the studies really depends on the study itself. So we've had studies where women can use hormonal contraception, um, that's totally fine. And then other studies where we're really interested in looking at cycle-dependent aspects of sexual response, so we have to exclude women who are using, using birth control pills or are using like um, hormonally impregnated IUDs and all of, uh, anything else that's got hormones in it. Um, we've had studies where we exclude women who are using antidepressant medication because antidepressant medications can have an impact on people's um, sexual response and sexual desire. It's one of the horrible side effects of antidepressants that is often associated with people discontinuing them, but um, we've, we vary. It really depends on the study. Um, usually we're looking for women, they've got to be somewhere between the age of 18 and 65. Um, we sometimes uh, target our studies at particular populations, so we may be interested in folks who are um, exclusively sexually attracted to women, or to men, or to both. Um, it really depends on the study. Yeah. Yes. I was surprised, but maybe I didn't get it quite right, when I thought I heard you say that men have more of a mind-body connect and women less so? Yes. Because I mean, I've sort of thought of men that don't sex with anybody, well, yeah. anybody that attracts them. Right. Whereas women, you want more of a connection. Mm -hmm. But what were you telling us? So what I was trying to characterize is this relationship between men having a physical sexual response mm -hmm. and then being connected to that and saying, so when they experience a, a penile erection, men are going to report, yes, I feel that I, I'm turned on and I'm feeling sexual desire. Whereas for women, we would see increases in, um, in blood pooling in their vagina or in their, in their vulva, but they would say, I'm, I'm not really feeling turned on. Okay. So there's, yeah. So nothing to do with relationships or anything? No, this we haven't. Yeah, this is again part of our lab. The, we, the mind is thinking about what the body's doing. Exactly, exactly. Mm. So how, how in sync those two aspects are. Mm. Yeah. Yes. What about survivors of sexual abuse? Do you ever do any research around that? So I haven't um, focused specifically on people who've experienced sexual yeah. abuse. Um, I have a colleague at the University of Vermont who does specifically, and she's been interested um, in looking sp uh, at women who've had childhood sexual abuse and how that has an impact on their, their sexual response in the laboratory. And um, you know, a lot of the 
for women who are survivors of abuse or sexual violence as an adult, um, as well as women who report that they're experiencing issues um, with arousal and desire, quite often what we see is that their ability to physically respond to sexual stimuli is mostly intact, and it's their self-report or their experience of that that's really different, that they may not feel turned on or they may not be connected to that. With the uh, childhood abuse survivors, there's sort of a, another wrinkle to that, which is relates to um, stress and stress hormones, and that that stress response in the face of sexuality might have a dampening effect on their ability to become sexually aroused. But that sort of um, couple of studies that have been done, sort of emerging research that's, that's starting to look at how it is when we're under stress, how that has an impact on sexual response.